Yay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to this weekend seminar, even though it's not in the right uh, time, as usual. We're taking advantage of uh, our visitor, so it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Dima Gutmann, who's actually uh, coming here uh, as a CPM speaker and a father of a uh, medieval student. So we took advantage of his visit um, to have him talk with us. Dima is a professor at uh, Barangang University, and he's been there uh, about 12 years. And I've been uh, periodically visiting him to see what he's been doing. Uh, but today he's here to tell us, so I won't say more and give you the floor. Thank you for coming. Okay, thanks a lot, Tanya. The posting means six years. But usual way to start your vacation. <laughs> and I came here because, as Tony mentioned, I'm, and for the first time ever, I'm introduced as a father of a student. Yes, and it happens to be like an incident, a McGill student, but here I am, and it's a nice department and all this pleasure. To be here and today, I'll talk about the work I've done together with uh, Yoni Lisika from Barlan University, who happens to be my PhD student, uh, who's about to graduate and Pavel Ostrovsky from Max Planck Stuttgart. And part of our research is uh, published on Archive and PRB, and part of it will be uh, published uh, soon. Okay, so the title of my work is a Heat Transport in Bio Semimetals in the Hydrodynamic Regime. This is an informal seminar, so please free to interrupt me and ask as many questions and engage in the discussion, because I can go for a long time and the story is is ongoing project, so it's not there's no 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 specific uh, uh, point that I really have to reach. Uh, okay, so I don't know how much you're familiar with all this subject. It has uh, built on several uh, elements. Uh, so just to be coherent and consistent, and the course it's also so. So first of all, let me start with a short introduction. What is uh, uh, bio semi metals uh, and why these bio semi metals are special. Uh, so, the standard story goes like that. So, the bio semi metal is essentially Dirac like material. It has uh, an even number of Dirac uh, points. These are the points where spectrum uh, of their electron and hole like uh, state structure doesn't have Dirac singularity, but linear Dirac singularity. This number of uh, Dirac points is always even, and you can make uh, make uh, the match can make uh, well, so metal by two ways, but you see it as a breaking uh, time reversal uh, symmetry uh, or breaking inversion symmetry. You can break both, but you don't necessarily need to break one of these things to have uh, uh, a single a single well. Uh, Okay, so let me focus for today in, uh, in, uh, in situation where the well uh, semi metal has a time reversal symmetry breaking. So, in this case, it can exhibit so called anomalous hole effect. So, what is anomalous and what is hole effect? Uh, hole effect means that there is a transverse, transverse, uh, transverse. Uh, Asymmetric conductivity, so it means that there is an electric field in one direction and there is an asymmetric current that flows in the opposite direction. And anomalous means that you do not apply an external magnetic field. So the magnetic the time reversal symmetry is broken in some way in the material, they don't know why, but we don't apply any magnetic field in the laboratory. So that's why this is referred to as anomalous hole. So, short story. Transverse conductivity without applying an external magnetic field. Okay, so uh, this is a simple model. I'm not saying it's a minimal model, but that's one of the simplest models that we know uh, of the spectrum that describes time reversal symmetry broken while a uh, semi metal near, near the vial node. So this thing captures a, a spectrum of. Uh, this is a caricature of the spectrum of bias in the metal in the vicinity of bio So this spectrum, if you draw it on, on a, a energy momentum uh, figure, it has two crossing points. 
and these two crossing points represent represent a while long. So if you look at this thing, it has this Hamiltonian has a spin orbit interaction part px dot sigma x dy dot sigma y, and the part which explicitly violates the reversal symmetry. So this this parameter lambda parameterizes the strengths and by which time reversal symmetry is broken in the system. So if you take lambda to zero, you restore time reversals. And in this figure, you see that lambda, the square root of lambda, is just the distance in the in the momentum space between violence. So if you if you if you take the limit lambda goes to zero, it means that you take lambda violence to be together to be coincided, and then you go from wild symmetry to Girard particle. Okay, so if you look at a uh, spin structure, this uh, sorry, just very small question. <laughs> when you do time reversal operation, p goes to minus p, sigma goes to minus sigma. Right, and so just by the lambda term, you already, I mean, you, you could set that to zero and still seem to get time reversal. It's going to be great. Okay, uh, good point. I will not. I will. Uh, I, I see what you mean. I, I yeah. I, I I don't I don't know how you go around it right now. Just uh, uh, it's uh, it's probably involves uh, it probably involves multiplication by sigma x matrices on both sides uh, as well. It's not just sigma to minus sigma, but but I'm not able to do the algebra. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So. So if you draw, if you draw the uh, the spin the, of the electrons on on, on both branches, that schematically they would look like this. So it means that this is caricature. That says the direction of the spin uh, is is pointing somewhere. So if you fix the momentum, you essentially you essentially fix the direction of the spin. So this is a, a spin of the of the coupling, and you can draw the the energy energy lines on that. On the uh, p parallel p c plane, and you see that uh, if you start with a small plane of, of chemical potential somewhere here, you will have small small Fermi pockets. Then you increase uh, you increase uh, the value of chemical potential at some point. So it just gets bigger, then you get a vicious transition when two pockets touch each other, and then this thing becomes a single. Single connect, single single connected Fermi surface, which encompasses both uh, one loss. This is just uh, a normal non topological material. So we see that the way there goes so this is transition. Okay, so if you look, uh, if you look at uh, uh, the vicinity, the vicinity of the uh, uh, vinyl node. So each vinyl node can be represented by Dirac. Spectrum non degenerate Dirac spectrum. So in the vicinity of one lot, the spectrum is just sigma dot p. And uh, uh, if you look at this uh, model naively, you can say that just by the fact that there is a distance, distance in case space between one lot, you can you can expect uh, uh, a quantization of whole conductivity. So you can expect that the whole conductivity is given by e square over h times delta k, which is the distance between well So essentially, the, the usual picture, which is due to Polkoff and balance, is that you can look at it as a set of parallel two-dimensional quantum hole plates in k-space. Each quantum hole space contributes e square over h uh, to whole conductivity, and there's decay number of the stated line between these two, two points, and they equally contribute to the, to the whole conductivity. You can translate it in many ways, but what I'm saying is that this result is correct, provided the chemical potential lies precisely at the well nodes, and both well nodes happen to, to be happen to occur at the same energy. So it must be the same energy of the well node, and the, and the chemical potential must be tuned precisely to this point. And in this case, this is what is predicted, and this is uh, usually referred to as intrinsic intrinsic contribution to the all conductivity. Okay. Now let's uh, continue from here. What are the equations? Is that is it happening in this simple model too? Uh, 
the presence of this um, separation, delta k? Uh, let's go, let's just make sure. So what do you mean in this simple model? The model that I drawn in the previous slide? <laughs> yes, in the, problem, in the model that I drew in the previous slide, if you go into that limit, that's what you get. <laughs> okay, so what, what is missing from this model? Uh, what is missing from this model, uh, even on the non-interactive level, is that what happens with this uh, result, if you, if you take your chemical potential away from the interactive point, what happens if you tune the chemical potential away from there? And when you tune it away from there, you can have uh, uh, an accompanying equation for how the disorder influences this result. So if, if you put, you know, we know that normally metal conductivity is affected by disorder. So this, this formula is quantized in the sense that it has absolutely no information about disorder. So the question is how disorder affects uh, whole conductivity, especially when you take it away from the interactive form. So this is the sort of question that I uh, want to talk about today. And uh, to talk about this question, we need to talk a little bit about a scattering theory. So what is special in scattering theory, sorry, in, in this problem, uh, that we all know that uh, the, the way to solve scattering problem in quantum mechanics is by uh, expanding expanding uh, wave function in the in the spherical harmonics. We normally say that the spectrum of electrons is p square over two m, so we have uh, s o s o c symmetry. We expand uh, states in terms of of scattering uh, states of the angular uh, momentum operator and compute scattering phase shifts, and that's that's the standard way to compute. Uh, uh, matrix elements and from matrix elements we can compute scattering rates and scattering times and then use the scattering times in equations like do the formula in the simplest in the simplest language. But here is a very interesting twist that normally normally is absolutely unimportant, but I think this is the first problem ever that this plays role that the system has explicitly the system explicitly breaks uh, rotation symmetry. And it's very important for us that symmetry breaks a rotation symmetry because you cannot have well symmetry metal if you preserve the symmetry. So in our example, we had a special axis which we called Z axis around which the rotational symmetry was preserved. So you could rotate around Z axis, but you could not rotate uh, any arbitrary with respect to any arbitrary axis. So that's very important. And moreover, what turns to be important, you cannot say, okay, and the system is not is not spherically, not rotationally invariant, but I don't care because, as I'll show you later, it's the violation of this uh, um, lack of uh, violation of this rotational symmetry, which is precisely responsible for effects like uh, whole conductivity. So it's very important to keep this into account. So it means that we need to to uh, uh, invent a scattering theory, to extend scattering theory for cases when the spectrum is uh, non, non rotational invariant. It's, it's a key element for this problem and other problem if you're interested in, in transversal responses. So, okay, so what, what should we do? How we write a scattering theory for a system with, uh, uh, with no rotational symmetry? So, first of all, uh, let's remind ourselves how we do a normal way. A simple way was to say, let's say, say that we have impurity, which is rotational invariant, we send a plane wave. That's the plane wave. Then we expand this plane wave, we present this plane wave as a superposition of spherically symmetric wave incoming and outgoing. So this is just a very complicated way to present a, a plane wave. But then people say, okay, one of these plane waves is here incoming, so it has no information about impurity, and another is outgoing, so it has information about impurity. And all this information about impurity is important in the scattering phase sheet. And then we can describe all scattering problems in quantum mechanics in by these parameters, which call scattering phase shifts. And normally, the higher you go in scattering phase shift, the smaller the scattering phase shift is. So if you have a scatter center of the radius A and typical momentum escape, then the scattering phase shift of the order A will be k times A to the power 12 plus 1. So it will get smaller and smaller if the if the wavelength of the electron is much is much longer than the scattering uh, asset. 
Okay, and then, and then you can represent this result by what's the so called T matrix, S matrix, and so on. So here we need to, to build a similar formalism, but, but not restricting ourselves to uh, uh, this type of impurities. So let me just put everything there because you cannot uh, uh, access it in real time. So here we did it together with Pavel Ostrowski, and that was essentially his idea. So what about he, what he invented? He invented, uh, he realized that in the small impurity limit, uh, we can build an analog of what is called S wave scattering in quantum mechanics. So we know that the simplest, simplest approximation in quantum mechanics is to assume that we only uh, care about S wave scattering and we have a single scattering phase. So there is an extension of this idea uh, to the case of, of to non uh, symmetric materials, non symmetric uh, spectrum. And uh, the extension is to realize that instead of a single scattering phase, we will now have two scattering phases. They call them delta plus and delta minus scattering phase that corresponds to projection of the total momentum. So the angular momentum is not conserved, spin is not conserved individually, but the sum, which is a uh, total momentum, is conserved, and the projection of this uh, total angular momentum on z axis is uh, is conserved. So you can have two projections up and down on this z-axis, and for two projections up and down, you will have two ways of the scattering phase. One is delta plus, and another is delta minus. So this is uh, this is the extension of the usual s uh scattering theory. So instead of just a single scattering phase, you have s matrix with two uh, scattering uh, phases. And uh, probably go into technicalities of this, but I don't think it's Oh, okay, but but can I relate this uh, scattering to the two nodes or something like that? Because you have something similar to rotation invariance around the node. Both both uh, both uh, states up and uh, down pointing states are built of the wave function coming from both nodes. Uh -huh. It's okay. not that it's not that one is coming from one and one is coming from another. And delta plus and delta minus. Are not related each to the node. They are not related to the node. Okay. They are not related. But of course, the fact that you have two nodes. Uh, yes, it's counting on that. Okay, so so then then the question is how you compute these two uh, scattering uh, phase shift, and and we are using an approximation which is which is called an. Uh, all books on quantum mechanics, slow, slow particles approximation, you assume that the size of the impurity is much smaller, it's much smaller than the wavelengths of, uh, of the electron. This is precisely the limit where S wave scattering in normal quantum mechanics captures the entire scattering process is the dominant. Can I ask, I mean, so one thing is to consider the full symmetries of the crystal and the other one thing is to say, Okay, there's some impurity which approximately has an environment that is rotation. So you're somehow thinking of the impurity as having the same so, as the crystal itself? Or? Okay, I fully ignore. Okay, so there is, of course, a symmetry group of the crystal. Yeah. I say forget about it. Let's let's look at the long, long wave limit where we can forget about this thing. But then, even in, and then you say, let's assume that the impurity is as symmetric as possible. Let's take an impurity to be sphere. Which is as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. And then even in that limit, I realized that even in that limit, there is there is no uh, way I can assume my, that the spectrum of my particles, the spectrum of my electrons is symmetric. I cannot I cannot choose the I cannot rescale the spectrum such that it would look symmetric. Mm -hmm. And then I don't have a basis to expand. Mm -hmm. I don't have in for this spherically symmetric problem, I had the basis, which was the basis of the Laplacian operator. And I said, let's use that basis and expand an eigenstate of that basis, and everything will, will be diagonal. Right. Of course, I can use the basis of, of, of Laplacian operator in any case, but that will be a horrible basis because then I'll have everything which is of diagonal huge matrices, right. and I will not be able to compute this. <laughs> so, but I, I really need to compute, and then we will get to that, we will see that there is a very important physical meaning in this 
uh, scattering phases and the fact that they are different is, is very important. So, but essentially, 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 because what I'm scattering here are spinners. They are not they are not scalar electrons. They are spinners, and then and then they are two spinners. They have a different projection on a z axis, which is reserved, and therefore these two spinners will be scattered in a different way from the impurity. That's the physical. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the fact that the electrons are spinners and they scatter different. If they would scatter the same, I would not have a whole effect. Okay, so so then I compute I compute these phases for this particular spectral line for a spherical impurities, and I see that there are two delta plus and delta minus, and this is scattering phases as well. Just one more thing. Uh -huh. You're still you're looking at uh, electrons from near one while mode at the time, or no? I'm looking. I'm looking at. Wait, I'm. <coughs> no, I. Uh, no, I'm not looking at the electrons in your mind. Not I'm looking at the electrons that uh, electrons have given energy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, so these are my scattering phrases. Uh, as a function as a function of a lambda, lambda is the wavelength of the electron. And you see that in general, uh, for particular, for particular strengths of the impurity, and for particular uh, way of chemical potential, let's say I'm changing a, the radius of the impurity. And then you see that there are two different values of scattering phases. You see the jumps, jump correspond to resonant uh, scattering. Uh, and but in general these two these two phases are different. Okay, then I'm using these phases and I'm computing T matrix. And T matrix is something what we need to compute the transition probability between state K and K prime. So if I know uh, T matrix for two values of between two values of uh, uh, scattering phase, uh, which, sorry, between two values of the momentum, I know the uh, transition probability between two states, just using Fermi Golden Rule. So the transition probability for electrons to scatter from state K to state K prime is proportional to the number of impurities times the T matrix for a given impurity. And now probability, the T matrix for a given impurity will be <coughs> probability for spinners is projection plus, and the spinners is projection minus to scatter, and it will be controlled by the scattering phase uh, delta plus, delta minus. Okay, so, so why these scattering phases are very important? Why having two different scattering phases very important? Is because now the scattering rate is a symmetric function. So the probability to scatter from state k to the state k prime is not the same as to scatter from state k prime to k. So this function is not symmetric function, as it normally is if you just use a naive uh, second uh, born approximation. So that's uh, that's the picture. That's the picture. Uh, symbolic picture. Uh, if you have if you have a in the state k and the state k prime, and you have transition probability to scatter from here to there. And the proposition means to scatter from there to here. These two, two things are not equivalent, but the difference is proportional to the sign of delta plus minus delta minus. So when this seems equal, the effect is gone. Now, why this effect is important? This effect is important because it's known as skew scattering. And if anyone who played tennis or similar game knows it, if you have a ball which spins around the text and it hits a ball, then it will be reflected. It will be reflected uh, of the wall, but if the angle of reflection will not be equal to the angle of uh, at which it hits the wall. And everybody who uh, plays the tennis professionally, of course, spins the ball such a way that it controls it controls <laughs> subjective. So, so that's that's a classical analog of a spin and its projection, and this is the scattering. So the similar effect is is responsible for skew scattering in 
And these materials now, oops, sorry, my Okay, so this is not the only pack which is there, but I can tell you that if you plot this diagram on one axis, you put impurity stands, how strong is an individual impurity, and another, you plot uh, how many impurities you have in the system, that everything which is above this black line, everything which is strong in the purple, is where the effect of skew scattering of individual impurity will dominate all other effects. So if you go below this line of BMS, there will be many effects. But all things about this black line will be controlled by skew scattering. And skew scattering conductivity, it has this very nice formula, the skew scattering part of co conductivity will be proportional to the sign of delta plus minus delta minus, or you can write more directly related to the experiment object, which is a skew scattering resistivity. So the skew scattering whole resistivity can be written in this very nice way in terms of scattering phase shift. So you know scattering phase delta plus, delta minus, and there is difference, and it fully controls, it fully controls a whole resistivity. So if you have an experiment that measures a uh, uh, whole effect in one semi-metal, you only need these two parameters to explain the physics. And now you can you can you can relate this thing into say temperature dependence of uh whole conductivity or chemical potential of uh whole conductivity and you can get these analytic formulas for example as a function of chemical potential you will uh see this cusp and this is precisely that you should transition or you can have this different uh, temperature dependence of all resistivity is the temperature if you can achieve chemical potential, which is usually very hard experimentally, but you have a temperature that you can control. Okay, so this is this is think, essentially captures uh, uh, some physics. So we, we learn from here that uh, it's away from away from the neutrality point when we have this quote unquote quantization of uh, whole conductivity, we have a more complex and interesting story, but nevertheless, there is a a region where you can uh, capture the essence of what's going on in terms of a simple skew scattering mechanism and write analytic formulas and compute uh, the strength of this of this effect. Okay, so with this, I'm uh, um, finish the first part of my talk, and I'm now going to discuss an additional set of effects which has to do with electron-electron interaction in the program. So if you have questions about the first part, uh, that's the time to ask. And uh, okay. Um, <coughs> there is another effect in side jump for this. Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, so in this diagram, where it will be. And here you will have side jumps as well as two scattering, as well as many other effects you can go into different names and depending on your formalism, they are indistinguishable. So, so there, are, so there are many interesting effects that I don't know how to tell one from another. That will be all here, uh, and uh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so now let's let's try to see if we can uh, add electron electron interaction. To the problem, and uh, let's look into a limit where this electron interaction is very strong. So we can think about the problem as a viscous electronic fluid. This is a very popular subject these days. Uh, but let me just uh, uh, remind you what do we normally uh, know about electronic fluids and metals. So it goes back to a very old very old uh, base, let's see if I have a, yeah, presentation here. Uh, we go back to 60s, and then it was theoretically envisioned by Grouget, and it was very far from any experimental realization. And essentially, the main, the main focus that time was what happens if you have a pipe, but full of electrons instead of water. And then the question is, how is there a uh, pipe 
to conduct and select and change its temperature. So it's essentially the question of was a flow that uh, uh, belongs to 18th century hydrodynamics. What is different if you instead of water molecules put their electrons? And uh, uh, then uh, people realize that there will be uh, an interesting effect as a function of sea temperature, as a, as a function of the, of the pipe uh, uh, radius. So essentially one is expected to see decrease in the, in the whole resistance, this increase of temperature. And this is very different from what we know of the behavior of electrons in normal metals. Normally the increased temperature, the resistance grows, but here the resistance decreases because because and the words people normally use that electrons that they go through the pipe in a more collective way than non-interacting electrons. So the, the distribution of velocity field inside this uh, 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 this pipe is now different from distribution of, of, of uh, non-interacting electrons. And now there are experiments uh, on this. There are many experiments. A uh, recent experiment that that uh, uh, confirm this this picture, and uh, in addition to that, there are uh, other examples where uh, electrons in hydrodynamic region were realized. In particular, graphene because it's a very clean material is a nice platform to study effects of electron electron interaction. And what people saw in graphene that near neutrality point, there is a breaking of uh, Peter Van Franz law and an enhancement, enhancement of uh, Lorentz number. Uh, it means that it's uh, thermal transport and particle transport are located by the same uh, channels. They also saw they also saw what people expect from uh, from Gouge effect as a function of the sample of the pipe radius and as a function of temperature. So the indication that this hydrodynamic regime is either realized or very close to being realized in, in real experiments. And, and last slide of experimental motivation, uh, uh, are materials that, that show a uh, uh, wild metal structure, which they measure heat conductance in these materials and uh, Lorentz number in these materials. So there is an experimental activity uh, in that direction that kind of motivates us to think what will happen is our theoretical prediction that instead of talking of non-interacting electrons, let's talk about an opposite limit about electrons that interact strongly and form a viscous fluid. Just small point that Guillaume Gervais uh, they, they see this sort of temperature dependence of uh, you show them the Grigi effect. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. yeah they're, 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 I agree there's a lot of evidence. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, I'm just, okay, so I'm just a curious. I'm not saying that there is a, a, a an experiment that already is clear on a on hydrodynamic part, but let's let the, well, let's envision what will happen if if they take a uh, Gouge picture and uh, and go for about seven minutes. Okay, so how can we think about uh, this problem? Uh, and what is different? What is different from uh, from uh, normal hydrodynamics uh, when we when we talk about well, semi metals. So, normal hydrodynamics is a very, very old subject. It goes back to Euler, Navier Stokes, and great mathematicians of, of 18th century. Uh, and one of the strengths of hydrodynamics is that it doesn't matter what system you try to describe, whether it's electrons or, or stars or water molecules at some very long uh, spatial and time temporal scale. A whole system will describe a universal set of very small number of equations. And these are very universal equation, equation that uh, uh, are hydrodynamic equation. And that's a, that's a normal strength of hydrodynamics. It's very universal. And you can you can use this set of equations to describe the motion of the 
what in the river we can we can think about galaxies low and then elementary particle and in that in that story will be star. So it's a very tremendously different uh, scale uh, separation. But uh, that's uh, that's very universal. But what is special? But there are some subtle differences. And here the question is: Will will in what sense the hydrodynamic equation we expect to derive will be different from hydrodynamic equations of water? Because if we'll end up having the same set of equations as we have in water, then we invested lots of money and effort to get something people in the 19th century already knew. So, so what is special in hydrodynamic fluid and semi metals? And the claim is that yes, it's the hydrodynamics we're going to get is very similar to the last hydrodynamics, but there'll be some special features that are absent in water, and they are coming from topology of this problem. So we are looking for some topological interesting features in this hydrodynamics, which is not in the Landau Lifshitz textbook. Okay, so I'll um, and the and the main main point in this story will be that this topology will be all coming from very curvature type of effect which are uh, uh, induced in this problem by, by this uh, while, not, while not touching by the spinner nature of electrons. So there is a very curvature there. It will induce some topology and all these non-trivial effects we discussed on the level of non-interacting electrons, they will all be translated and promoted in hydrodynamic regime as well. And it will give rise to interesting effects. Okay, so how do we derive hydrodynamic equations? So my favorite way is to start with Boltzmann equation. So this equation that describes evolution of the distribution function in the phase space. So F is distribution of electrons in the phase space. What, what is the number of electrons at a certain point in the phase space at the position R, momentum P at the time T? And there's this equation called Boltzmann equation. The left-hand side is just a little bit equation. It says that the, that the probability of electrons evolve with the velocity r dot and force k dot, so it evolves in the k space. But this evolution is not continuous because there are scattering processes there that breaks the, the continuity of evolution in the phase space. And the objects on the right hand side are called collision integral. And I wrote here two typical collision integrals that we really need. One is collision integral, which is a electron electron collision integral, which describes collisions between electrons, and another is disorder collision integral. So all the parts that we discussed in the first part of my talk were counted by disorder collision integral. And this describes the scattering between the electron and the static disorder. So when we look at the left hand side of this equation, we have our dot. So our dot is the change of the position this time. So that would be normally called velocity. And people who would read uh, some textbook on physical kinetics, then you say that you need to write the set of R dot a gradient with respect to k of the spectrum. Okay, if you take spectrum k square over to m, you take the gradient, you get that R dot is equal to k over m, and that's what we normally call velocity. It's almost correct, but that's not the whole story because there is a part which is called anomalous part, and it's related to, to the very curvature of the material. And if material has no very curvature, this part is simply absent, and then we'll have a normal normal simple kinetic from the old textbook. But if you have materials this kind of curvature, and this always happens when you have touching points of different bands, then there's this additional term, which is called very curvature term, or anomalous part of velocity operator. And this is observed by Leitinger in the 60s of last century. OK, so, so now what, uh, what shall we do next? Well, first of all, we want to derive a uh, hydrodynamic equation from this equation. So we need to project this equation on the conserved mode. So we need to realize that conservation of particle implies that the integral of the electron electron collision integral is known to momentum is identity with the field. This means this applies a particle conservation. If you multiply the collision integral by momentum and integrate this respect to momentum, then you get how much the total momentum changes due to electron electron collision. And the statement is that the total momentum doesn't change. Each individual electron changes its momentum, but the total momentum is constant. And the last equation is the equation of conservation of the total energy. Once again, each electron changes its energy, but the total energy doesn't change. So these are conservation laws that must be respected 
by all reasonable electron electron collision integral, this is a consideration of the problem. So now let's let's now use this identity and get and get a, a set of equations. So let's multiply this equation by one k and energy and integrate this equation with respect to k. So in first case we get what is normally called continuity equation that says the density of electron changes with respect to time as a divergence of some current. So it means that the electron's number is conserved. The second equation will tell us about density of momentum. So it says that the equation, the density of momentum would be conserved. This is the first two term. The first term is the density of momentum. The second term is the density of flux. But there are things that violate the density of momentum. First is the applied electric field that drives the system and changes its total momentum. And the second one is disorder collision integral. This is scattering of the electrons and the soil. This also uh, violates the total momentum conservation. So this is almost a conservation of the momentum modified by external forces and collision integral is static disorder. And the last one is equation that uh, is the equation that provides continuity of energy density, so the energy density will be conserved if system will be not subject to electric field. So this is the dual heating term. Okay. Now the, the only thing it's almost a close set of equation, but we don't know this tensor, and we don't know the relation between energy current particle current, and uh, densities. Okay, so now let's compute these things. So to do it, one uses a local equilibrium approximation that says that if electron and electron interaction are very frequent, are very strong, so the best way to, to approach this problem is to say that locally, system is at Fermi equilibrium, but there are some unknown values of chemical potential temperature. Now, this is Fermi Dirac like distribution function, any collision integral must be nullified by Fermi Dirac distribution function. And now let's imagine that instead of having chemical potential, which is constant, let's assume that chemical potential is slowly changing function of position and time, and the same about temperature, temperature is slowly changing function of position and time. Now, because collisions are local, they are not sensitive to the slow variation of the temperature in space, and chemical potential in space and time, and therefore, and therefore, I can make these variables to be slowly variables of position and time. And the additional variable that I introduced here is called boost velocity, and it says that I can look at the problem from moving reference frames. If my reference frame moves in const this constant velocity, it should be a Kelly's collision integral. And now, once again, I can make this boost velocity slowly changing function of position and time. And now, and now, if we look at what happens near a single while node, we will see that uh, there are different modes that play different role close and far from the neutrality point. So let's consider what happens when we boost boost the equilibrium function with the, with the constant boost velocity uh, at the neutrality point. So I'm plotting, I'm plotting here uh, by black dots electrons above the surface and white dots are holes that are created below the surface. So now I have three electrons above the surface that move to the right and three holes that move to the right. I have one electron that moves to the left and one hole that moves to the left. And this excitation is created by, by going, by having an equilibrium distribution function and, and shifting it with a constant velocity to the right. Now, what, what does this excitation describe? What is the particle current and what is the energy current created by this excitation? So if you look at the particle current and the electron current, you understand that zero because you have three right moving electrons and three right moving holes, but they have an opposite charge, so it carries no electric current. And the same thing to the left. So electric current is zero. 
But if you look at the hit current, you will say that these three guys carry hit, and these three guys carry the same hit. So we'll now have a finite hit current moving to the right, which is six, and then two hit finite hit current moving to the right, which is two, six minus two is equal to four in some proper units. So if you go away from the violet, that similar story will be reversed. This thing will have a finer particle current and zero heat current. So it means that this boost zero mode, velocity zero mode, derives finite heat current near neutrality point and no <coughs> particle, no electron current, but has a derives finite particle current and no and no heat current far away from neutrality point. But, sorry, Dima, mm -hmm. where does you come from? Is that your current or no, just say let's let's imagine we, we created this this mode, yeah? Okay. Collective mode. So what this excitation will do to the problem? I'm okay. just exploring the role played by, by zero modes of my collision integral phi and close. Okay. okay. So now what is what's now to time space where it's coming from physically? Where the boost velocity is coming from, and that's the answer where it's coming from. It comes from the competition of two things. There is an electric field which tries to derive the system to accelerate the system in, in its direction, and there is a restoring force coming from, from static impurities. And there is a balance between these two forces. So system is at constant velocity, reach constant velocity, <laughs> and the friction between electrons and impurity is equal to the driving force by electric field. And that establishes the average velocity at which it which electrons are going to move. Okay. So sorry, I'm I'm a bit surprised or confused by the fact that there's a different story if the chemical potential was far away from the while mode mm -hmm. versus if it was at the while mode. Mm -hmm. uh, this from the sort of, I think of that as a Hamiltonian, it's not obvious to me that needs to come. Yeah, I guess I have to just write it out and think about it. You're saying that there is a difference. Yes. Yes. Where, yes. In one case, it appears as a particle current, in the other case, it appears as a current. But, but for all these hydrodynamic effects, presumably you just have to be a very large hand to potentially gather as many electrons as possible. Uh, no, no, you will, you will have two different, what I'm saying, you have two different types of hydrodynamics, and it's also very well known. You can have you can have a hydrodynamics, which is essentially a relativistic type of hydrodynamics yeah. near a zero point, yeah. and then it will be in the university <laughs> class of relativistic hydrodynamics. Uh -huh. Or you can be in classical hydrodynamics. Uh -huh. When you are far away from neutrality point. Right. So these are different chapters in the books of uh, hydrodynamic undulations. One chapter is uh, uh, non relativistic and but, actually, but, 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 but assuming U is small, does it actually matter right? relativistic or non relativistic? U is small compared to the Fermi velocity. So U is always small compared to the Fermi. Yeah. That's for sure. We are never talking about so U. Does it actually like... matter whether you actually have to think about relativistic or non relativistic? Yes, it will matter a lot. Just a tiny it will bit. matter a lot. It will, it will, it will lead to totally different regimes. It will have a lead to totally different regimes. And yes, the short answer is yes, it matters a lot. And another quick question. Uh, can you forget about the bandwidth and just uh, treat the Dirac cones as infinite bandwidth directly? Yes, it's a full note that if I'm very naive, and do it com completely disconnect them and forget about that they're connected, I end up in a situation which high energy physics would call an anomaly. I think they would call it, I forget what's, sorry, I forget, it's probably, I should say, kind of anomaly or some other anomaly, but, but essentially high energy physics are precise in this situation. They don't, they don't have an access, they don't have a latest model. Yeah. They only have a continuous description near the well nodes. And if they can forget about it completely and they don't, and you don't realize that the electron that leaves one while not ends up at the other, and you you, you lose the, the particle conservation and you you are you are you ruin the, the problem. Yeah? But but of course there is this effect that should not be uh, sensitive to how exactly uh, these things are connected. But you need to keep track of it that the spectrum is continuous. Uh -huh. 
Uh, so if you if you if you put the right conditions, it will cause the details of how you connect it at the bottom of the should not enter, but don't don't ruin the particle conservation. Okay, uh, now let's 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 look at currents. So now all currents, remember you get current by multiplying distribution function this velocity and the proper proper quantity, which is a charge. So if you say that you're interested in electric current, you multiply by electric charge. Velocity and distribution function. This is how many electrons you have at the momentum k. This is the velocity of this electrons, uh, uh, and that you multiply by charge to get electric current. If you are interested in, uh, um, let's see, say uh, energy density, you multiply uh, distribution function by the energy and velocity. That's how much is energy flux at this moment on K, you integrate with respect to K and you get the energy uh, current. That's, that's, our, that's our textbook picture about getting currents. Yeah? So we get a particle current, momentum current, and energy current in this very uh, simple and intuitive way. Uh, now, almost, almost correct here, just don't forget about anomalous storms. And so these terms would not be there for classical fluids, for fluids made of electrons, made of particles with very curvature, there will be another term which will be important for transversal part of conductivity, such as all conductivity, this uh, very curvature current, magnetization current, and so on. So the simple physical picture in mind, uh, this I have, it's like two fluid hydrodynamics. One hydrodynamics is normal hydrodynamics coming entirely from distribution uh, function and real scattering transition. And another is ideal fluid that does not participate in real scattering processes. Uh, it comes deep below Fermi C, but these are anomalous scattering processes should be taken into account. For example, what we saw as an intrinsic contribution uh, to all conductivity is entirely coming from there. So it's not participating in heat dissipation. Okay, so, so this is one part. Now let's look at the normal regular part. So this regular part is again should be subdivided into part that is scaled by zero mode and the part which is scaled by uh, dissipative massive mode. So there's a part which is scaled by zero modes that we discussed so far. And there will be small but very important corrections, which are dissipative corrections, and then create by massive parts. But this, this part of the story is within standard, standard classical hydrodynamics. This is not. Okay. <laughs> so what are ideal parts? Ideal part is very simple to understand. So if we have a boost velocity U and uh, and is a uh, the density of the fluid, the ideal car, the ideal part of the of the fluid is the velocity times boost velocity. If you have a uh, boost velocity U and the entropy density S, that's the ideal contribution to the heat current. What is dissipative current? Dissipative current and this slow correction to the heat current, which is called heat conductivity times gradient of the temperature. So it's a, a small gradient correction that is responsible for dissipative processes in the problem, such as heat conductivity, viscosity, and so on. Okay. So you know, I know we disturbed you a lot, but we're right. No, let's go. That's the, that's the problem. That's, that's the goal. <laughs> yeah, so a few more minutes. Thanks. Okay. okay, so let me just uh, let me just go quickly. Maybe, maybe let's go quickly to the results. So, so you can write you can write heat current and particle current in this nice form. It's called Amsager response coefficient. So you essentially write this as the matrix of particle current and heat current proportional to the driving forces. Driving forces is electric field and the gradient of chemical potential, the gradient of temperature. And then the goal of kinetic theory is to compute these exaggerated coefficients 
So in particular, the coefficient L11 is called, is known as electric conductivity. And all other can be related to electric thermal conductivity, thermal conductivity, and so on. And these anxiety coefficients are very symmetric, they must satisfy anxiety reciprocal relation. So it's all very well a uh, long story. How do we compute? If we know the coefficients, we know all conductivities and vice versa. So how do we compute it? And, and well, semi metals, well, I'll not go into the detail. I'll just uh, mention that there is a part which is carried by ideal uh, and a, a part of the uh, process and dissipative part of the processes. And now you will see that uh, close to the vial node, dissipative channel starts to dominate over the ideal part, if you're interested in the electric conductance. And that's precisely because of the reasons we discussed that role of zero mode uh, changes. Sorry, I mean, yeah, maybe again, I'm, it's a terminology. So, I mean, sigma xx is dissipative, the real party, always, right? What What is ideal and, and, and also, like, I was... So when you when what so how parallel is somehow the impurity driven pattern? Yes, correct. And 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 you treat this in like some kind of relaxation time approximation for the two collision intervals. Relaxation time approximation is a strong word. There are lots of relaxation times, right. so you need to look at the proper channel of relaxation. So multiple relaxation times. It's about relaxation time, but projected on the sector which preserves all the consideration. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And then, and then you see that this thing, this thing is, is carried by uh, zero modes, and and there is a part which is uh, which is carried by a finite energy mode, by finite excitation. Uh -huh. And now you look and compare, and now because there are scattering processes between electron and electron are very fast, that naively this what well, this I call dissipative part is is very small because it's proportional to tau e. As opposed to the ideal part, part which is carried by zero modes. But now look at it. You see that these two guys are essentially <laughs> the same. So the ratio between them is the ratio of, of disorder scattering time and tau e. But close to the neutrality point, this say is n square over w, which is ideal contribution, is proportional to the chemical potential square. So when the chemical potential goes to zero, this guy loses. And then the dissipative part, which you know, naively would say that's that's a small uh, contribution, so it plays the role and controls the physics there. Okay, I'll not go into the details because there are many important details. Uh, but uh, let me just get to the result. So the result will be that because of that, uh, you will see that there is a there is a very large Lorentz number uh, near a while node and a small Lorentz number away from the while node. So exactly what we saw in the first slide in the experiment in Dirac is manifested here in the vial semi-metal as well. And this is in the channel of uh, longitudinal conductivity. If you will go, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the comparison to graphene and that's this peak. And now as you change, as you change the whole angle, as you as you change make the the lambda, the distance between nodes larger, you see that this this phenomena is being uh, magnified. Uh, and now you will get something which you don't see in your fan, and this is something unique for the uh, system is uh, violated. Uh, the reversal symmetry, you will see transverse field conductivity and transverse field resistivity. Okay, there is a physical picture that explains how you can uh, uh, get it, but okay, we will not get into uh, this, but, uh, but essentially we can, we can compute it, and this is the result. So you will see a non monotonous, monotonous dependence of, of uh, transversal field conductivity. As a function of chemical potential and temperatures. Uh, it's a correction if you subtract some trivial, some trivial part you expect from Bidemann's uh, 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 contribution. 
So, yeah. So we see there is a peak in uh, Lorentz number and in X, Y, in transversal Lorentz number, and there is a peak in, in uh, transversal heat conductivity. So, okay, so I try to, uh, to I say a few messages here in hypothetical story. So there is a different role played by zero modes, near while nodes that are carrying particle current, don't carry particle current, but carry heat current, and the wave <coughs> from the while node they reverse zero modes. Uh, uh, a boost uh, velocity zero modes carry a particle current, but no heat current. A uh, deviation from Peter Mann's France law uh, is enhanced by, uh, is observed in a dynamic regime and enhanced by violation of uh, uh, time reversal symmetry. Uh, and there is a non monotonous uh, dependence on uh, transverse heat conductivity and manifested a uh, Lorentz number. So I guess I was passed in the last part. Great. Okay, thank you so much.